Congressman, go ahead. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, this is Congressman Jay Inslee. To all of uh, our neighbors who have joined us tonight, I'm uh, welcome to the 1st District. And I'm very excited about an opportunity to uh, to talk with you about the, the health care reform bill tonight. And I appreciate everybody's interest in this tonight. Um, we are, Patrick may have explained this tonight, but uh, we're going to take as many questions as we can tonight. And anyone who develops a question at any time tonight, if you punch star three, uh, we'll queue up for those questions and get to as many as we can. I want to thank you. What I thought might be useful is to uh, go through some general descriptions of the bill for folks that might answer questions that, uh, that a whole bunch of uh, people may have, and then we'll get to individual questions as quickly uh, as we can. If people do know I voted vo uh, a yes on the bill and uh, realize that this is the first step um, the bill is not an absolute perfect bill, as many uh, bills are not coming out of Congress, but I do think the bill moves us forward. And what I thought I would do is to share uh, maybe a three or four, five principles behind the bill and then go through with a, a, uh, a description of, of people as to how the bill may work in your individual life. So there's kind of five ideas behind the bill that we're, we tried to accomplish. Uh, first, we tried to move forward with a, a principle that all Americans would have choice of their insurance coverage. We felt that this was a liberty interest, that Americans should have a choice where to obtain their health coverage, and that principle permeates the bill so that it's not an insurance company uh, telling you where to get your insurance or where not to get your insurance. Uh, it's not the government telling people uh, where to obtain their insurance, but it's a matter of individual choice, and that's one of the reasons why we made sure that people uh, who had pre-existing conditions, people with diabetes, people with cancer, people with respiratory problems, high blood pressure, would always be able to pick their insurance company rather than our insurance company choosing them. And I think that uh, the importance of that was brought home to me. I met a fellow during the course of this name, Gary Hall. Uh, Gary was a famous Olympia, Olympic American swimmer. He won five gold medals. And he had insurance through the Olympic National Committee for 12 years. And as soon as he left the Olympic program, he was totally uninsurable because he had a pre-existing condition. They said he wasn't healthy enough to be insured. So if a fellow with five goals can't be insured, uh, we know he had a problem. So we fixed that as part of the bill. Second uh, principle, we attempted to make sure that, that all Americans exercise some personal responsibility in contributing to their own uh, health insurance costs by procuring insurance. And we felt that that's a matter of personal responsibility. And for a long period of time, uh, many Americans have received health insurance but paid nothing for it because of a lack of insurance. And so we've created a system where we all contribute in some degree. Third, the bill focuses on prevention and wellness rather than just illness because we know that our health is improved by preventing illness rather than just responding to it. Fourth, we wanted to make the insurance industry much more fair, and we we know Americans have been, frankly, uh, victims on occasion of inappropriate insurance company practices. So we now have the right to for 25-year-olds to be on their parents' insurance. Uh, we have a provision that children will not be able to be kicked off their insurance because they, they get sick. Uh, and there will be a provision that insurance companies must uh, essentially provide a service of a percentage of their, of their revenues and a host of other, other things that, that really help consumers. Uh, fifth, we were uh, persistent and insistent that the bill be fair to Washington State. And um, the Medicare system has been unfair to Washington State for, for decades now. And I and some of my colleagues uh, were insistent and were successful in a provision that will uh, increase reimbursement rates so that people can get physicians to treat them and hospitals to, to see them. And it was really a big victory for Washington State. So those are sort of five principles the bill uh, attempted to hew to, and I think largely did. What I thought I might now do is to go through um, kind of a quick rendition of people and how this may affect their individual lives. And what I thought might be helpful is to just describe uh, people and certain characteristics on how the bill will affect them. Let's start with those who have their own insurance today uh, through their employers, which are most Americans. Uh, the impact on people who have insurance today who are, healthy, health, uh, who are happy with their insurance, uh, the impact is really quite uh, modest. Um, there will be no uh, requirements or changes for people who have insurance 
There are additional benefits, however, for people who already have insurance. And probably the biggest benefit is that um, we know those of us who are lucky enough to have good health, it is a great blessing, but it can uh, disappear at any moment. And we know that any of us who develop a condition, uh, we are only one job loss away from being uninsurable. So all of us who have insurance today will get an added benefit that even if we develop some uh, condition, if we change jobs or if we're laid off, we will have the protection to be able to buy insurance even with that pre-existing uh, condition. A uh, second group, if I may discuss, those who receive their insurance from Medicare. Uh, Medicare beneficiaries are going to have some benefits immediately, one of which is to close the donut hole, this uh, pernicious hole in prescription drug coverage that will be closed. And that's a significant benefit. Um, second, the, the, uh, the bill will extend the financial uh, stability of Medicare as, as evaluated by the Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan group. It's either neither Democrat nor Republican. And they have concluded there will be no cuts. I want to reiterate that. Zero cuts to Medicare benefits and will extend the life of the Medicare program. Uh, third, students. Students will receive a considerable benefit in that they will be able to be remain on their parents' insurance uh, up to age 26, which I know is of interest uh, to many of us who have tuition payments that we're concerned about. There's another thing that's not health insurance related that was in this bill, which is helpful to students too, which is a significant uh, reduction in the cost of, of student borrowing. Uh, so students will get a very significant reduction in their borrowing costs, uh, and it was... Uh, part of the health insurance bill, but important to students. Uh, the fourth group, folks who do not have insurance today, will receive, uh, at certain income levels, significant subsidies. And we know it's difficult to, to obtain insurance for folks who are in the bottom quartile or so of, of earnings. So what uh, this bill will do will provide a subsidy, courtesy of Uncle Sam, to folks in, uh, in, in sort of the lower quartile of income level to help them obtain insurance. And what the, the way it works is it provides a subsidy so that people will never um, have to pay over a certain percentage of their income uh, into insurance. And it, it works, it starts at a maximum of 2% for those underneath $29,000 of income up to 9.5% of those up to 88000 for a family of four. So it's quite a, a a benefit for this subsidy to allow people to obtain insurance. Now, those families will have a a, uh, a choice whether to buy insurance privately or not. If they buy private insurance, they will receive the subsidy. If they do not, they will pay a somewhat higher tax on their tax return um, uh, to make sure that we all make some contribution uh, to uh, our health care. Uh, fifth group I want to mention is small businesses. There is a very significant benefit for small businesses, which is a tax break uh, of up to 35% for small businesses. Uh, for those under 50 employees, if they uh, provide insurance for their employees. So it's a very significant help to small businesses that have found it very difficult to provide insurance for their, um, their employees. The sixth group I'll mention, which is all of us, which is all of us who are uh, concerned about the federal deficit. We know that this is a very, very dangerous thing for the country. We know we have to face this problem. And fortunately, this bill has been rigorously evaluated uh, by uh, a referee with a big, huge whistle, which is the Congressional Budget Office. And this is the professional group that is not elected, and they evaluate bills to see about their impact on the deficit. And they have concluded that this bill actually will reduce the federal deficit about $130 billion over the next 10 years. And that number is a prediction. It is not a guarantee. But it is, gives us hope that this bill is going to help in the reduction of the deficit because it essentially saves money through efficiency, raises some revenues because there is a tax, an increase on those who earn uh, a couple over $250,000. There are some revenues generated with a net benefit to the federal treasury to reduce the federal deficit. So that's kind of a quick summary of the uh, bill, and now I would love to turn to questions, and again, to ask questions if you'll hit star three on your phone, and uh, are we ready for questions? Okay, so, uh, with that, uh, I'm uh, turning to our noble staff who are working night here, nights here for us, who worked very hard, by the way. By the way, we had 
One of the successes in this bill took place at 3 a.m. the night before the vote, where I uh, was successful with some of my colleagues in negotiating a, a resolution of a, a reimbursement rate so that people in Washington can finally be treated fairly. So there was a little work involved. So here we have uh, Virginia uh, from uh, Bainbridge Island, I believe. Virginia, you're on. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for all your hard work. We really appreciate it and to your aides. And I wanted to ask about Medicaid uh, um, eligibility for people on Medicare. Um, a lot of us are just a little bit over and can't qualify for Medicaid as a supplement. Will, that, will more of us be able to get Medicaid now? Yeah, the bill does uh, allow the extension of Medicaid eligibility, so additional people will be eligible for Medicaid. It will vary some degree on what the states do with some of the federal benefits that are provided. Washington State has led the coverage, and single childless adults, single chi adults who do not have children for the first time, will be eligible, and there will be benefits by the federal government to the state to help the state. And, of course, as you know, Medicaid is a program paid partially by the federal government and partially by the state. So there will be decision making by the state, but there will be assistance from Uncle Sam. And um, even if you are not eligible for Medicaid, if you don't quite fit the criteria, because of this uh, pretty generous subsidy, uh, we'll have millions of people who now cannot afford insurance will be able to afford insurance. Let me give you an example. If you if you earn less than $29,000, you will get a subsidy from, uh, from uh, Uncle Sam, and the amount of the subsidy will be an amount so that you never have to pay more than 2% of your income towards insurance costs. So there will still be a small contribution, up to 2% of insurance costs, but the bulk of it will be paid by an, uh, a subsidy by Uncle Sam. So it is a benefit for those who have not been able to afford it. And it's the reason well, it, it will provide insurance for probably 96% of Americans. And that's 32 million Americans. And uh, a lot of folks are out there tonight without health insurance. Um, so thank you. Next one, David from Woodenville. David? Taking my question. Uh, yeah. My question is um, how this bill is constitutional and falls in line with our constitutional government and why you felt that it was the federal government's role to, uh, to nationalize health care like this? Well, those are important questions. I appreciate the, the questions. First off, uh, we have been, we have evaluated this from the constitutional perspective uh, very, very closely. And uh, the vast majority of evaluators who have looked at this have concluded there are several grounds for the constitutionality of this provision. Um, the first being the, uh, the, the ability and obligation of the federal government under the tax authority, the, the ability to raise taxes and levy taxes under the U.S. Constitution. And that is, uh, has been consistently been applied to be uh, uh, an ability of the federal government. The second is under the Commerce Clause of, of the uh, federal government, which has been very, very broadly construed by the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, there's only two cases in the last 50 years that have struck down a, a decision, and both of those required requirements on the state rather than in, on individuals. So the vast majority of people who have looked at this issue who are knowledgeable and who are not political partisans have concluded that, the, uh, that this is constitutional. I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, Ronald Reagan's Solicitor General evaluated this issue, and uh, Ronald Reagan's Solicitor General was the lawyer that Ronald Reagan sent to the Supreme Court, and he concluded that the, the uh, challenges now against the law by several of these attorney generals were, in his words, absurd, and that's a quote, which is pretty strong language coming from a Solicitor General. Um, professor Stuart Jay, a law professor, from the University of Washington, believe that this was, if not frivolous, close to it. And there's an analysis of this uh, on the web. If you want to, there's a Seattle Times article about this. There was a forum. If you're interested in this, I would recommend it to you. So we're pr quite confident it's constitutional. Your second question, why is the federal government involved? Well, bottom line, for the same reason the federal government um, was involved in Social Security, which was controversial in the 30s, and Medicare, which was controversial in the 60s, but both of which I think have been proven to help communities and families. 
and keep the, the country united. And now in this international economy, uh, the United States has an interest in providing not only health for its citizens, but from an economic standpoint, we're now competing with the world and the rest of the industrialized world does have uh, insurance and doesn't force private insurers to subsidize those that don't pay for their insurance. So it's a competitive disadvantage. I think it was uh, the right thing for our country to move forward. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. And again, if anyone has a question, uh, for instance, they want to find this discussion about the constitutional issue, if they'll call my office or send me an email, we will uh, we'll make sure to give you the citations for those things. Uh, next question from Laura Sprague. Laura? Hi. Yeah. I, my question is that I'm a disabled veteran, and I, I'm also, I also have Medicare, and I'm concerned about how they're going to intertwine, and will it be, you know, will, will it affect me get, being, you know, getting my disability through the VA or getting my health care through the VA, or will it help? I mean, you know, I'm just concerned about, there's like, now it's three things instead of just two things that are right. combined. Right. And I I go to the VA for care, and I have some Medicare care also. So. Well, first off, thanks for you or your family service that made you eligible for VA. We, we appreciate it. It was because of their contributions uh, to freedom that we were able to have a vigorous debate about this bill. So thank you to you and your family. The bill uh, is only going to help uh, both those who are on the veteran system and in the Medicare system. First, for anyone who is receiving veterans benefits, the bill really doesn't have any impact, um, uh, plus or minus, except to the effect that it helps veterans a little bit because Uncle Sam doesn't now have to subsidize the cost of 32 million Americans who are now not contributing to the cost of their health care, and Uncle Sam has to pick that up. But there are no changes to veterans' benefits at all in the bill. For Medicare benefits, there is only an improvement, underline that, only an improvement in benefits. The improvements are first closing the donut hole. Right now you get prescription drugs essentially through Medicare, but there's a big hole after you re a, reach a certain level of cost, you don't get any more reimbursements, and we're closing that hole. So it's a very significant improvement for our seniors who are dependent on Medicare, and we know how fragile economically and sometimes physically our seniors are, and I'm very pleased to report uh, that, uh, that this is an improvement to Medicare, and I know it has to be because uh, my dad's a, a vigorous 82-year-old, and, and he'd absolutely take me down and throw me down and and give me a whooping if we didn't take care of his Medicare. So uh, that's an overstatement, by the way. He's a great dad. Um, he's a coach at Garfield and South High School. But in any event, uh, and the other thing about Medicare, it's going to extend the fiscal stability of Medicare. As you know, Medicare um, over time would have a less stable fiscal base because of increasing number of senior citizens and increasing costs of medical care. But this bill, because it, it both... Uh, brings new efficiencies to the system. It drives out waste in the system and fraud in the system. And by the way, one of the things, the good Republican ideas we incorporated in the bill was a provision to be able to to be more aggressive in, in finding people who've defrauded the Medicare system. And we appreciated that Republican idea. We incorporated it in the bill, and it's just one of the things that will help Medicare remain stable for decades. Now, there's additional revenues that do that as well, um, in this tax on, on uh, for incomes over $250,000, and I want to make sure people understand that, this only applies to incomes over $250,000. So it'll help Medicare in the long run, and I think that um, you'll find this pleasing uh, over the long term. Thank you very much. Next question, Jeffrey, I, I believe it's Gillis from Kirkland. Jeffrey? Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my call. Hi. Um, I had a question. You mentioned earlier about doing this because it would make us more competitive uh, worldwide. And one thing you notice when you look at other countries and how they do health care is that they either have a uh, public option, if you will, or they uh, will allow insurance companies to sell insurance, but they enforce a uh, nonprofit status on basic insurance plans to keep the cost down on the insurance itself. 
And the question I have is, uh, I know the public option was taken out of this particular bill that's been passed, but do you see that coming back, or do you see that as being something that, uh, uh, you know, in a further go-round would be added in to put more pressure on the insurance companies to be more competitive? Yeah, I, I supported a public option in the bill, and in fact voted for the public option when the bill left the House of Representatives the bill had a uh, an option for people to essentially, if they wanted to, and again, only if they wanted to, to receive their insurance through a Medicare-like like a program. And I supported that. I thought it made sense to give Americans that choice. Uh, but the votes did not were not there to support that in the Senate, so uh, that was unable to pass simply on a matter of not having enough votes. What I think could happen, and I can't predict the future with certainty, obviously. Um, I'd be in Wall Street rather than a mere congressman if I could. Uh, but what I think could happen is if we find, if Americans find that, particularly in in locales where there's not enough competition, where Americans finding they really don't have a choice of private insurance, if those stories start to mount, you know, over the years, I think that this could get another look. It's not going to be in the next, you know, year or probably two. But it also uh, gives us in the state of Washington, in any state, the ability to effectively have that through our basic health care plan. So states can, if the state opts to provide um, uh, something like our basic health care plan in the state of Washington, states themselves can adopt, in a sense, a public option for people should they desire it. So it gives the states freedom to do that. So there's a bit of an amalgam moving forward. Um, the one thing I will say about this bill is that it's like everything we've ever done in healthcare. It, it is evolutionary. Uh, things will change. We will find things in this bill that are not working, and and they will be fixed, and uh, and we'll do that as soon as possible. It's just the nature of something as complex as this. Um, so I can't predict the future, but I would not be surprised at all if we have a vigorous debate about that somewhere in the years in the future. Uh, next uh, question, uh, Bridget Desari. Uh, Bridget? Uh, yes, this is Bridget Desari. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, wanted to know, I wanted to know if, um, if your uh, children are covered under the parents' plan only if they're students up to what, age 26? No, uh, you're, you're covered up to age 26 whether you are a student or not. Um, and whether you do your homework or not, you still get it. So it's still a benefit for all, all of our, our hardworking young people. And this is obviously a very important thing, particularly in today's economy where, where our kids are having such a difficult time getting into the workforce. This is a very difficult time for people to go out and look for their first job. And a lot of our kids are obviously, you know, sort of under our protective wing for a little longer than we might be if, if the economy was soaring. So I think it is an important thing. And it is the right thing to do. And it's just one of those things. It, it's not perhaps earth-shaking, but I think it makes a, a big difference in people's lives, and, and I'm glad we were able to do that. Next question, Rita from Mukilteo, where I was the other day and saw your beautiful city hall. What a great spot. It's totally energy efficient, and Mukilteo did a great job. Rita. Um, yes. Uh, I did ask the question about Medicare, the cuts to Medicare. You did answer some of that. So um, the yeah. only thing that I have to say is that I'm not real happy with the way the bill was passed, with no none of the Republicans voting for it. So it just doesn't seem like uh, uh, the right way to be doing uh, work in Washington. Well, you know, uh, I understand that, and, and I think all of us, we would have liked to have had a unanimous vote. Uh, you know, we would like to have had everyone uh, reach a total consensus on the bill. Um, and I'm sorry that more Republicans did not join us. There, the interesting thing about this bill, I will say, though, is that this originally, and this is kind of a, a great irony, this bill, the nature of this bill, really was originally a Republican uh, idea. Uh, when Back in the early 1990s, when uh, President Clinton attempted to do a health care reform bill. The alternative that was proposed by many Republicans was essentially this bill to have a private choice by people 
of how to obtain their insurance with some uh, encouragement to actually buy private insurance. Seven Republican senators uh, co-sponsored a bill to do that. Then in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, essentially the, this bill was, was adopted in the state of Massachusetts. And guess who the governor was of the state of Massachusetts when the bill was signed? It was Republican Mitt Romney. And that bill was voted for it by now Senator Brown, who as recently as a month ago said he would not vote to repeal the Massachusetts bill. So the irony of this thing is that something that as recently as, as three or four years ago was embraced by many Republicans, including Mitt Romney, governor of Massachusetts, now maybe presidential aspirant in the Republican Party, seven sitting Republican senators and uh, various Republican think tanks were for it then and not for it now. Now, I think that's curious. Why that is, I don't know. But something that was seen as a very moderate proposal a few years ago, now many people feel, uh, and many Republicans and my colleagues argued was, you know, was, was a takeover of health care, and it simply isn't. It's something Republicans originally proposed. And I think one of the things that was unfortunate in this discussion is the level of, of misinformation that you may have heard uh, spread by people with partisan agendas. And I think that's really unfortunate. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, the people who are opposed to this, funded by the insurance industry, and you just need to know who is against this bill, the insurance industry has spent millions of dollars trying to kill this bill. They had over 2,000 lobbyists uh, who were trying to kill this bill. Well, a lot of their allies went around trying to tell you and, and millions of Americans that we had death panels in this bill. And they went around the country saying there's death panels and the federal government's going to order, you know, our grandparents to be unplugged. And it was just a bunch of hooey. It was just a total falsification. And yet they scared the living um, uh, life out of a lot of people thinking that this bill was going to, you know, have death panels in it. Well, that was just false. And I can't count the number of other deceptions that you have heard about this bill that, frankly, are not accurate. So perhaps if we had a less of that, and if people hadn't been so falsely scared of this bill, maybe more of my moderate Republican friends would have been able to vote for this bill. And I, and I think some of them would be if this hadn't been such a hysterical discussion. So we're always looking for bipartisanship in Washington, D.C. We had some. We took some good ideas Republicans had. And uh, we'll always look for more in the future. By the way, just so you know, we're, we're working on some bills um, on a bipartisan basis now. I'm working with Dave Reichert on a bipartisan bill to, uh, to fix the problem that led to the tragedy of the four officers shot in Lakewood. I'm working on a, um, a bipartisan bill uh, to essentially uh, make sure that we don't have prescription drugs that will be flushed down the toilet and end up with our either in the sound or our kids taking them. So we have a lot of bipartisanship going on. It just didn't happen in this one, unfortunately. By the way, again, if anyone, people have any questions, if you feel free to push star three, star three on your phone, and we're going to get to as many questions as we can tonight. Uh, thank you, Rita. Next question, Al from Redmond. Yes. And a question regarding the uh, small business tax credit and uh, how yeah. that applies. The... Uh, yeah. I, I was able to find most of the answer on irs.gov. Uh, I'm, I, am, I am frankly amazed at how quickly they cranked that out. Um, but um, I, the, I guess the question, since I've kind of answered my question online here while, we, while I was waiting, in reference to that credit, uh, the small business owners, like say a sole proprietor that is running a business by themselves, basically is not getting a credit. Um, is that accurate? Uh, I, I, if I understand your question, I don't think so. Uh, let me just go through this and, and see if I, I can answer the question. First off, small businesses of less than 50 employees are exempt from the uh, requirement that, that larger employers contribute to the health care of their employees. So if businesses under 50 are, are exempt from that requirement. Mm -hmm. For businesses under 25 employees, uh, whether they have or have it not now, will receive a tax credit of 35% for the cost of the premiums 
and that will rise to 50% of the cost of the premiums in the year 2014. So if you choose as an employer to provide coverage for your employees, and your 25 employees or less, you can receive up to a 50% tax credit, whether you are doing it now or not. If you are a business of over 50 people, there is an obligation to contribute to uh, the employee's health coverage, either through actually purchasing it or through paying a tax of, um, and I'm trying to recall the number exactly, and I'm trying to recall, I'm sorry to dredge it up here, and I'm going to have to come back to you a little later with the exact number. But in any event, small businesses will have the choice, and uh, at least up to 25 employees will have a tax credit. Uh, does that answer your question? I wanted to make sure I understood it. Al, are you there still? Al, I'm sorry, I, I can't get back to Al, but I hope, Al, I hope that answers your question. If not, give me a call, and, 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 and tomorrow we'll make sure you get us resolved. Uh, Connie Apolsbo. Connie? Yes. I'm surprised you, uh, I got through. Uh, I want to know how you're going to keep doctors on Medicare uh, when uh, uh, you, you haven't uh, put money in there to cover. Uh, in fact, you're cutting them. Well, um, first off, the, the bill does not cut uh, reimbursement rates for physicians. There is another bill that was enacted years ago that has to get fixed to make sure that the, the cuts it would propose do not go into effect, and I'm confident that is, issue is going to get resolved. Right, what but the bill does do, before you sign a bill, don't you think all of those issues should have been done? And did you read the entire bill before you voted on it? Uh, yes. You're, you're saying, yeah. well, this law is there, that's there, but we're going to correct it. And then you make a comparison of Social Security and uh, Medicare, and they're both going broke. And I can tell you why, because I'm on Medicare. I'm 76. And I remember when I went to the doctor and could afford to pay him. Since Medicare came in, you can't afford it. So are you, are there? you against Medicare? Yes, I do. I, I want to make and sure don't I understand. tell me how you... great it is because I have so many stories for you. Uh, you don't have time for me. Well, I'd love to take time with you anytime if you'd like to give me a call. Let me try to, to answer your important question. First off, um, the bill that we voted on and worked on over a year and a half, and I am very familiar with the bill because I worked very closely, as I said, in many late nights working on this bill. What the bill does with your Medicare is improve, with a capital I, improve the reimbursement rate for physicians in the state of Washington. Now, you don't have to just take this from me. You can take it from the physicians who have endorsed this bill. The physicians have endorsed this bill, and the physicians are unlikely to endorse a bill that is going to end up with them getting paid less for their services. So the physicians community has endorsed this bill. And the reason they have endorsed it, in part, is that something I succeeded on. I was appointed as one of the eight members of Congress in the House to come up with a plan that will fix a long disparity where the doctors that you go to were not receiving enough money. And I'll give you an example of that. The doctors that you go to in Washington State for the last 20 years have been paid 20 to 30 percent less than the doctors in New York and Miami for the same service. And right now, because of that, the average Medicare beneficiary in Washington State, or in Seattle, uh, receives $7,000 a year in Medicare benefits. The average beneficiary in Miami, Florida, receives $14,400, over twice as much, or excuse me, $16,400. So this has been hugely unfair. So the, the, the problem that you're telling me about, we are improving in this bill. Secondly, we are improving the donut hole. And I don't know if you've experienced the donut hole, but many, if not most, or many in any way, uh, seniors have. That means after their, their total prescription drug benefits get to a certain level, they have to start picking up 100% of the cost of their prescription drugs. This is very, very hard on senior citizens. That donut hole is being plugged by this bill uh, almost immediately. So in two very important ways, oh, by the way, and the hospitals are the same thing. Our hospitals have received unfair, low reimbursements for decades in the state of Washington. 
And the hospitals have approved this legislation because, in part, this improves the reimbursement rate that hospitals will get paid so they can provide you and I, not me, I'm not on Medicare, but you, uh, adequate hospital coverage. So I'm very confident in saying that the physicians know that what they're talking about, the hospitals know what they're talking about, and, and uh, the seniors who have also, the AARP who have endorsed this bill, know what they are talking about, which is that this is going to improve Medicare benefits. And this is very, very important. Uh, I'm not going to vote for a bill that's going to, that's going to uh, you know, damage senior citizens' health care. And this is improving it in, in a variety of ways. So our next question is Jana. Jana? Yes, I'm here. You're up. Yes, hi. Um, hi. My question, I was for, totally for the public option. Mm -hmm. And by not having it, but also... Um, by paying for federal government paying for people's premiums who um, don't make very much money, uh, how is there any kind of provision in there to control the the premium charges that these insurance companies? I mean, right now they charge outrageous amounts, and I can just see us fattening their wallets with our taxes. Yes, and this is a very important question, and with your permission, I might take a few minutes to talk about it, because it's very, very important in the cost structure, both of premiums and health care costs in general. First off, the, the clearest thing the bill does is that it, it assures that insurance companies won't pocket over a given percentage for profits and administrative costs. It makes sure that a certain percentage is paid out in medical, medical benefits. And it's the first time that that requirement has gone into effect for insurance companies, number one. Number two, Finally. This, yeah, number two, and this is the most important thing. You don't think of it in cost, but it is related. It'll assure that everybody, you know, you can't be denied insurance if you have a physical condition. And that's the most pernicious because basically insurance companies have been, have the model we have today Insurance companies, the ones that are profitable, are the ones that make sure that they insure, pe insure people who don't need health insurance. And that's the whole game. Well, this whole matrix is changing now. Every insurance company will be required to insure anyone who walks in the door who can pay the requisite fee. And so that's a significant change. The third change is a deeper change, which is not relevant just to insurance companies, but to the, to the medical care uh, industry in, in general. Uh, the charges associated with our medical care have been going up at about twice the rate of inflation for quite a long period of time. And right now, America now spends uh, about 16 to 17 percent of our national economy on health care. The next closest country is about 11 percent, and we're generally about twice the national average for industrialized countries. So we are spending enormous amounts of money relative to other countries, uh, and are, you know, there's arguments about where the best hip surgery is, but as far as ultimate health, um, you know, I'm not sure we're getting twice as much health than we are in a few other countries. So there are ways to reduce the cost, and it's necessary to do this. Or everyone's going to go bankrupt, including the federal government. The bill does take some meaningful steps towards cost reduction of health care, one of which is a change in the way that physicians and hospitals over time will be reimbursed for care in Medicare. Right now, uh, reimbursement is based on quantity. It ought to be based on quality. It ought to be based on value to people's health, not just volume of services. And because we have this pernicious payment system, we have a situation where, for instance, the average Medicare beneficiary in Seattle, we spend $7,000. The average beneficiary in McCollum, Texas, they spend, they spend $14,500. $14, and the reason they do that, frankly, is that there's perverse incentives that incentivize the overuse of certain techniques that cost enormous amounts to the taxpayer, don't provide any more health, but do create, you know, some income. And that needs to change. So there's a change over time um, 
to try to get more value out of the medical system per dollar. And we know we can do this. We've had some really, really good things done in Washington State. We have a very progressive leadership. I'll give you an example. Children's, Earth, children's Hospital, when they saved my brother's life, they were Children's Orthopedic Hospital. Now they're Children's Hospital. That was in the 50s. Um, children's Hospital has reduced the rate of infections uh, for patients who are on ventilators by 60% just by adopting some quality control measures. They have figured out a way to provide quality uh, hospital services to people who, uh, with half as much floor space as the average hospital in the state of Washington. And they've done this because they've been committed to providing quality, not just quantity, of healthcare services. And those kind of ideas they've been successful with, we really need to spread nationwide. I'm now working with children to try to get a national training center to train other hospital administrators and staff how to go about this quality system that can reduce costs. So we do have a necessity of reducing the rate of medical inflation. The bill does take some first steps. Frankly, if I was going to be critical of the bill, uh, I, I this is one of the areas I think the bill could have been better. I, I think it could have been uh, a little more aggressive on efforts to change that system. Uh, but it's a start, and it's a necessary start. So uh, I think we're heading in the right direction in that regard. Our next question is Carolyn Anderson from Pulseville. Hi, hello, thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, hey, it's a windy day. I'm making chicken noodle soup, so. <laughs> well, my son needed some. He was sicker than a dog yesterday. I wish you could oh. help him out. <laughs> He's okay I now. Have, well, I have a lot of questions, but I the first one is I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, and Patty Murray and anybody who put this past. This is 40 or 100 years past due. Uh, I, anybody who's been to Sweden, Norway, or Denmark knows what I'm talking about. This is wonderful. When does it become effective? And I'm paying a penalty for drug coverage from my Social Security because I've never had it before. I'm pretty healthy. But can I cancel it now and say, okay, no drug coverage penalty. Can we go on it pretty soon, or is it four years? Well, there's an immediate uh, rebate for Medicare beneficiaries who hit the donor hole of $250 this year. So this year, if you hit the Medicare uh, donor hole, there's a $250 rebate. Uh, over time, and this is kind of complex, but uh, for the next several years, starting in 2011, there is a discount for brand name drugs from the pharmaceutical industry, and it ramps up to 75% coverage for brand name and generic drugs by 2020. And then it essentially fills, totally fills the donut hole. So there's an immediate $250 benefit to seniors this year, and that will ramp up to totally closing this hole by the year 2020. If, if uh, they're paying, if, if they need drug coverage. But if they're not using drug coverage, is there any benefit? Well, everyone is entitled who is on Medicare to prescription drug coverage. If you don't want that, you certainly don't have to take it. But... Anyone who now is eligible for the Medicare prescription drug benefit will receive this closing of the donor hole. And, and, and frankly, this is a really, really important thing to seniors, you know, who are on fixed incomes who hit that hole in coverage. And by the way, there's one other thing I want, you didn't ask this question, but I want to note. Um, when the prescription drug benefit was passed into law uh, during the, the past president's term in office, uh, one of the problems with it was that it was all deficit spending. That means under the previous president's uh, proposal for prescription drugs, all of it was borrowed. It was all deficit spending. We didn't think that was right. And so what we did is we took a different approach in this bill, which is to pay for it, to, to make sure that we didn't add to the federal deficit. And it, frankly, um, it, it's something that I think is important that, not many people have noticed the difference of our approach than the previous administrations when they adopted the Medicare prescription drug benefit. So we have improved this in two very important ways. Number one, we've closed the Medicare drug hole. And secondly, we've done it in a way that is paid for. That means it's not borrowed from our grandchildren. And when you pay for things, 
there's nothing free in life so that there are some revenue provisions to pay for this. It, it falls on people who are uh, fortunate economically and those who are over $250,000. There is an also an additional uh, uh, quite small charge on, on the medical device industry to help finance this as well. But I think it is important to do this in a, in a deficit-neutral way. And you will hear debate about, about the deficit impact of this bill. Um, and it won't surprise you that those who are opposed to it, you know, say one thing, and, and those who are for it say another thing. I, the best evidence that I could guide people to is if they want to look at the evaluation of the bill by the Congressional Budget Office. This is a budget office that is neither Democrat nor Republican. It has no ax to grind. These are professional civil servants. They don't answer to the president or anybody in Congress. And they don't care whether the bill passes or, or fails. And they do a very scrupulous evaluation of it using very sophisticated computers. And they came out and concluded that this actually reduces the federal deficit by $130 billion a year. So it's an important factor. None of us can brick with certainty the exact cost, but I think we have some reason for confidence. Okay, next question for Christy or Bill Dyson. Christy or Bill? Bill Dyson here. Yeah. Bill, yeah, fire away. Uh, you, you mentioned one thing to start with. Uh, the $130 billion is not per year, is it? The yeah, savings? it's over 10 years. It's over 10, 10 years. years. Yeah, you and, said one year. And then, yeah, I misspoke if I did. And then in the second 10 years, the Congressional Budget Office uh, predicts that that will actually increase by a fa several factors. They're, they're very yeah. optimistic in the second decade. Yeah, that wasn't. My question was uh, recently, the last few days, we've been hearing about all these hundred billion to billion dollar write-offs that companies are having to take because of this bill. Is this right. real or not? That was you my know, question. It, well, I, here's what I know about that situation. I'll, you'll have to reach your own conclusions. Uh, some companies are are saying they're taking a charge down associated with uh, a, a change in the tax law applying to the medical benefits that these companies pay. Some are not. GE, for instance, is not taking a charge down. Now, the business roundtable that represents a lot of these companies have concluded that this would actually save uh, $3,000 per employee in reduction in costs. So there's kind of different opinions coming from different parts of the business community. Uh, what this was is that in a previous tax law, and this is going to be a little complex, so I'm going to make it as simple as I can. In a previous tax law, there was a provision that gave corporations a, a tax break for a portion of the premium that they pay for their employees. But then the federal government started to subsidize a portion of that, uh, of that payment by some of these corporations. So what happened was is that some of these corporations ended up taking a tax break for something that Uncle Sam was paying for. Well, that's just inexcusable. There's no way to justify that. So the change was is that for the portion that Uncle Sam was paying for, a change was made so that these corporations no longer get a tax break for them. And I think that 99.99% .99 of my constituents would agree with that principle. Now, it may end up that some of these corporations may end up paying additional taxes as a result of losing that inappropriate tax break. But it's just indefensible that people who are working hard to hand out tax breaks to corporations that don't deserve them. So uh, I think it was, from a substantive standpoint, the right thing to do. I have not heard any um, you know, folks, at least in this area, who will be jeopardized by that. And I guess I would say that one thing going forward in the bill, everything that bad happens in America, you know, people will blame it on passage of this bill. And all of us are going to have to judge it, uh, you know, with as much uh, straightforward thought as we can. And, and I want to say going forward with this bill, this was a very complex bill. It's the most personal thing in our lives is our health. Many of our people obviously had very divergent opinions about it. It was very, very controversial. People spoke very vocally about it, which they had a right to do. And 
we had to exercise our best efforts to find uh, the biggest consensus possible to move forward. And we attempted to do that. And we did it with a little bit of humility. I, I have to express a, a little humility. I think and believe strongly that my vote was right. But I also believe that we will find things in this bill that will need improvement as it improved as it went through the process. The bill actually got better in part because some of the criticisms of the bill. I'll give you an example. In the Senate provision, there was this odious provision where a senator from Nebraska wheedled a, uh, you know, a, a deal essentially for his state that just was totally unjustifiable. And that was soundly and appropriately criticized. And we got rid of it. We fixed it. And so the criticisms that were, that were raised against the bill during the process actually made it a better bill. And as time goes on, I'm sure there will be others, you know, that we need, we need to look at. Um, so with that, I'm told that our time tonight is coming to an end. We had 6,087 of our neighbors on the call tonight. So I'm very appreciative of people's interest in this. I hope people will consider this a beginning of a dialogue. And I would encourage anyone tonight who has uh, any questions that we did not get answered tonight, if you can make sure, um, and uh, for just a moment, I'm going to tell you how to stay on the line and make sure you can get those answered. Um, so here's how it works. If people didn't have a question that did not get answered tonight, um, and if you can hold on a second, they stay on the line and help me out. Uh, you can give a call to my office at 1-800-226-7144, 1-800-226-7144. And um, I want to say there's a way to leave the question tonight on the phone, and I'm looking at my staff right now and asking them how to do that. If you'll stay on the line, I'm going to a bit adieu, and if you stay on the line, and I'm asking Patrick, what do they need to do to ask the question, Patrick? Press star three or what? Yeah, if you'll stay on the line tonight, uh, after I bid adieu in just a few moments, uh, you'll receive some instructions about how to pose the question, and we will get those answers to you. Uh, you can also reach me through my website at www.house.gov forward slash Inslee, www.house.gov forward slash Inslee, or you can just give us a call, um, shoot us an email, and we'll get further questions answered. I do hope that you'll stay engaged. I hope you'll help us to continue to improve this process. Uh, as we all experience this, I'm going to encourage people to let us know of your criticisms or suggestions for improvement, uh, because uh, this is not, not the end. Uh, this is just another step forward, I hope. And I'll, again, I want to thank you for your... Uh, participation tonight. It is a huge honor to represent you, and uh, I hope that we can all achieve some mutual success. With that, I'm going to stay on the line. Now, the next voice you hear will be, um, will be instructions about how to record a question that we will then get to you in writing or by email to answer your questions. With that, uh, friends, uh, I'll bid you good night.